I at some point in our lives and wondered what it would be like to travel into space, the final frontier. Less than 600 people have ever had this experience and only a few of them have ever been able to share their unique experiences with the rest of the world. We're excited to welcome Colonel Terry Virts to Google today. He is a retired NASA astronaut and a celebrated thought leader, speaker, and author whose seven months in space included piloting the space shuttle and a Russian Soyuz spacecraft, commanding the International Space Station, completing three spacewalks, and performing scientific experiments, one of only four astronauts in history to have served in all of these capacities. He is currently involved in several film and television projects, serves on corporate boards, consults to the entertainment industry, and writes and promotes on public policy. Today, Terry is here to discuss his new book, How to Astronaut, An Insider's Guide to Leaving Planet Earth, a collection of essays that look at the realities of space travel that covers all aspects of his experience as an astronaut, from the practicalities of how to execute everyday tasks to the not so normal task of filming an IMAX movie from the International Space Station. Terry says in his intro that he wrote the book with two goals in mind, to make us laugh and to make us say, wow, often. Having read the book myself, I can say to Terry, mission accomplished. While, while in space, Terry took more than 300,000 photos, some of which he'll share with us here today. The images are an integral component of the National Ge Geographic IMAX film, A Beautiful Planet, which he helped shoot and stars in. And without further delay, I'd like to introduce Terry. Hello, Terry, and welcome virtually to Google. Pedro, man, and thanks, thanks for that intro. It's great to uh, great to be here and great to talk to the whole Google community. Um, I'm actually far away right now, but uh, I'm not my my normal home is Houston. I'm actually in the Middle East right now, visiting a friend. But um, it's really cool to get to connect. It's that's why it's so dark outside. It's like the middle of the night, but um, that's okay. <clears throat> I'm going to jump in with a share screen um, and share a little bit. Of, I got a few slides to share with the community tonight. How can you see me? Okay. Is that good? Yep. We got you. Okay. Awesome. So thanks for the intro about the, the book that I have out. Uh, I've kind of got a lot of different things going on in my life. I've got a few book and TV and film projects that I'm trying to work on. And then also I've got this uh, kind of a few tech businesses that I'm helping to get going. Um, That's a lot of fun, but how to astronaut is really like, I love it because it takes this experience of space and brings it. I hope the goal, like you said, was to bring it to um, lots of folks. And so there's 51 chapters. It's a, uh, it doesn't, you don't have to be a space nerd to get into it. You know, it's something that men and women can enjoy that young and old can enjoy. Um, but I just want to take the kind of stuff that you would expect about space travel and also a few things that you wouldn't expect about space travel. So I have a few slides to talk about some of the topics that I broach in this book. <clears throat> and uh, as you can imagine, every good astronaut story starts with launch. And so um, my first launch was on Space Shuttle Endeavor back in 2010. Then a few years later, I got to fly on the Russian Soyuz, which was, there was those are two very different experiences for me. Um, they both end up in the same place in low Earth orbit, but in this eight and a half minutes of getting smashed back. So they both get up to about three Gs of acceleration during launch. So it's kind of like laying on your back and having a couple of your best friends lay on top of you for eight and a half minutes. <laughs> so it's it can be tough to... Uh, tough to, you know, just breathe. You have to, the Russians have a centrifuge where they teach you how to breathe because um, when you're coming back, if you have a, what they call ballistic entry, you can get up to nine G's, which is pretty hard to breathe. Um, and the, the acceleration, the noise, the vibration. Um, when my space shuttle Endeavor launched, it was four in the morning. It was like nighttime turned into day. And uh, so all those experiences, you know, I had been a fighter pilot and a test pilot. I thought I had done some cool stuff in my life. And man, there was nothing like launching in a space shuttle. Uh, so the the chapters on launch are pretty cool. There's one, one of the unexpected ones, is, I think it's called the red button or something like that. There's a guy at, at the Kennedy Space Center that's got a red button that does what you can imagine that it does. And um, 
I have a funny story about how my whole astronaut class learned about the existence of this red button. Um, but thankfully they haven't had to use it. Um, <laughs> uh, all the, you know, at least recently the launches have been pretty safe going uphill into space. Um, spacewalking is another thing that you would expect in that, in my first Na national geographic book, I wrote a huge chapter about spacewalking, um, in how to astronaut. I think there's a whole section. There's four chapters or something like that. Um, the first thing about spacewalking is that spacesuit. It is massive. It's uh, probably 150 kilograms on Earth. You know, in space, it's weightless, but it's still bulky. It's still massive. It's still pressurized. It still has these metal rings that are not designed to. It it our joke was it's not designed for the human body because they're just so hard to move in. Uh, it's also its own spaceship. If you look at this picture, I've got all those little black dots are um, little small rockets so that if you accidentally let go and you float away and your safety tether breaks, you could still fly back to the space station. It's got communications, it's got cooling, uh, and you carry all this equipment. So you usually have a hundred pounds or more of stuff attached to your spacesuit somehow. So just getting out the door is quite an experience. And then once you're out there for, for my three spacewalks, I've never been so busy in my life. I, I've never felt so on the clock in my life. Like I didn't even have 10 seconds to waste. Uh, but there was a few opportunities where I would stop and kind of rotate my body around. And you could see in this picture, the sun rising in the background. And when I saw that, I remember this one particular moment, I was on the front of the station um, at, in the front of node two by PMA one, uh, two. And I looked at the sun and it was like, I was seeing creation, you know, like this is God's view of the universe. This is something the humans weren't meant to see. It was this amazing, just indescribable moment. And then after about five or 10 seconds, I had to get back to work because I had to plug in the next cable and, you know, I was running behind the schedule. So <laughs> spacewalking is probably the most extreme juxtaposition of sublime and mundane that I've ever experienced in my life. Uh, but it's pretty awesome. It's 99% work and 1% awesome for sure. Um, one of the things that you would expect, and also one of my favorite things to do as an astronaut was learn how to do medical care. So I was the crew medical officer on my space shuttle flight and also for my long duration 200 day mission. Um, and, uh, before the long duration mission, NASA actually sent me to the Houston medical area, downtown Houston. And I worked in the ER and in the OR for a week, like working on emergency room patients, uh, watching operations happen. Um, we had a cadaver, like a human cadaver that we trained on and practiced on. And it was the most amazing experience. I loved it. I really loved medicine. In fact, when I was done, um, I went to Barnes and Noble and got the MCAT book <laughs> and I flipped through it. I'm like, maybe when I'm done with my astronaut career and after about two or three minutes, I put it back on the shelf and said, yeah, this isn't going to happen, uh, which is pretty fun. Now my son is applying to medical school and it's, uh, Man, it is a tough road, but I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun getting learned how to do the basics uh, and take care of my crewmates. Something <clears throat> you may not expect astronauts to do, um, but is it's been a huge part of my career. In fact, the chapter is one of the biggest in the book. I had to cut it in half, um, is survival training. So when I was in the Air Force, I had to do survival training um, they called it survival evasion, resistance, and escape. So in case you get shot down in your fighter jet and you become a prisoner of war, they train you on what to do. Um, and then I had to do it again with the French Air Force because I did an exchange there and I thought I was done. And then when I came to NASA, I had to do uh, the basic survival course for, because we were flying T-38 jets and a lot of my fellow astronauts had never been through the military course. So we all did it. And then I thought I was done. And then NASA sends their crews on this thing called Knowles National Outdoor Leadership School. And I did it once and I thought I was done. Then I had to do it again. Um, it's like 10 day, two week kayaking trip in Alaska, which was actually awesome. But it's also, you know, it can be pretty rough. You're, you have to uh, pack everything with you. And when I did it in September, it literally rained every day, all day of the entire time. Uh, and we had a great time. It was it was just an incredible experience, but it was pretty challenging too. After that, I figured I was done. 
But then when I got assigned to the Russian Soyuz, um, the Russians have water survival, which is pretty intense. You have, well, you're inside the Soyuz capsule, which is like being in the front seat of your minivan with two other crewmates in giant bulky spacesuits. You all have to get out of the spacesuit while you're inside the capsule and put that orange Pharrell's uh, like water survival suit on. Or for winter survival, you can see me there in my jacket in, in the Russian winter. Um, you had to put on your winter gear, which is kind of like the uh, the Christmas story snowsuit kind of thing. Um, but we had to wear those. Um, but those are valid because every once in a while, you know, we just had a Soyuz accident and the crew had to eject, if you will. So you might end up in Siberia. You might have, end up in oceans. So you have to practice for all that stuff. So. That's part of the story of being an astronaut is learning survival training. Um, flying jets is probably the most important thing we do as astronauts. For sure, it's the most important training um, because it, it teaches your brain to have something called situational awareness. And it, it, it teaches you to be able to think and stay ahead of the jet. So T-38s are pretty fast, they're supersonic, you know, they're Air Force trainers, but NASA uses them for astronaut, we call it space flight readiness training. So especially astronauts who aren't pilots, who they weren't military pilots for their day job before they came to NASA, they ride in the backseat, they're crew members on the T-38 with us, uh, they do comms, so they talk on the radio, they run the navigation systems, and they help us fly the T-38. And what that really does is teaches us how to work together in high intensity, stressful situations, and also um, how to be in a situation that what we call is operational. So if something goes wrong, you, you might die. Unlike in the simulator, if something goes wrong, you hit pause and you get out and then you go to lunch. But in a jet, you, there's no pause button. So um, even though the stick and rudder skills of how to land an airplane are not required on the space station, the mental skill the we call it airmanship um, of just having situational awareness and staying cool under pressure um, is super important. Probably the most valuable training that we do. Uh, this is a funny one. You know, I, always, I joke that of all the things I thought I would have to do when I signed up to be an F-16 pilot, um, doing <laughs> cutting women's hair was not one of them, but I flew with uh, here Anton Shkaplerov uh, Russian cosmonaut and Samantha Cristoforetti, an Italian astronaut. And Samantha is very, very, very famous in Italy to say the least. She's actually probably the most famous um, Italian in the world, man or woman. She's super famous. And so lots of women fly in space. They have been since the 60s. You know, that's not a new thing, but most of the time they just let their hair grow long. They put it in a ponytail and they don't worry about it until they get back to Earth. But Samantha has a short haircut and, you know, she's Italian. And so we had, she wouldn't let me launch until I went with her to her hairdresser and learned how to do um, women's hair styling, which there's a whole thing to that. It's, it's, there's all kinds of stuff that I never knew, but now I did. And it was super stressful. It was probably the most stressful thing I did in space was cut Samantha's hair. It was much worse than spacewalking. Uh, and as you can see from this picture, it's a, it's a three person job. So Anton would, would hover overhead with the vacuum cleaner. I'd, I'd cut the hair, he'd suck it up, and it was pretty funny. The European Space Agency, ESA, did a pretty funny video, like a high-speed time-lapse of me cutting her hair. Um, but I think it it came out okay. She seemed to be happy, and she's still my friend, even though it's been a few years. So I think it, was, it came out okay. The mission of the space station is science. And during my... Uh, uh, 200 day mission. We had 250 different experiments. We had um, combustion experiments, material science, basic engineering. There were some psych psychological experiments on us. Um, lots of, or some astronomy and cosmology. There's a particle detector looking for uh, essentially dark matter, which is pretty amazing. They're trying to figure out what the universe is made of. Um, but the, it's the, the human physiology and the biology that I think is really interesting because those are things that can help us down here on Earth. And part of that is rodent research. Um, this is an example of the, some of the rodent facilities that we had. 
Um, and I'm working with my crewmate, Scott Kelly there. And it, it's just really important. We, I did a couple different experiments with major drug companies. And uh, one of them was to work on bone and muscle drugs to get improve them. And then uh, the other one was to work on a vaccine, potential vaccine for salmonella and E. coli, which are obviously bad, uh, bad down here on earth. They kill a lot of people. So doing the science in space was fun, but it was also, uh, you know, one of the probably the more important things that I did. Sleeping in space. I got a chapter about that. In fact, I've, I've done some, um, some talks on calm, you know, the calm app and, uh, they love me. They're like, man, your voice is so awesome. It puts people right to sleep. So, uh, when I first flew into space, I was kind of worried, would I be able to sleep? It's crazy or floating, you know, am I going to be able to sleep or not? And the answer for me was, it wasn't a problem at all. It was the best sleep of my life. It was, um, you just float there on the space shuttle. I'd have to take my sleeping bag and clip it to the wall. Um, so I didn't float away, but on the space station flight, I had my own crew cabin. You can see it there. It's like a telephone booth. I'm not really asleep for this picture because I'm taking the picture myself via timer. But um, when I would really sleep, I would get in the sleeping bag, cover my whole head and arms and everything and just float, just free float there in the cabin. And it was, it was awesome. It was so cool. I would put, uh, I had some Bose headsets, so I'd put those on. And for about a month, I would just drift off to sleep listening to the Interstellar soundtrack, the Hans Zimmer soundtrack to the movie Interstellar. Uh, and then the Russians, the psychologists, uh, sent up some MP3 files to the cosmonauts that were sounds of Earth, like uh, rain, uh, jungle sounds and birds chirping, a crowded cafe, waves, just basic sounds from earth were so amazing. So for about a month, I would go to sleep listening to these sounds, these, this MP3 file that my cosmonaut buddy gave me. And I, I noticed something really crazy that when I was doing that, when I was listening to sounds from earth, I was dreaming of earth. Like my dreams were of earth. And when I wasn't doing that, my dreams were just black nothingness, kind of like in the asteroid field and the empire strikes back or whatever. It was just black floating emptiness, which was interesting to me, something I never thought of before I went into space. Um, exercise is super important in space. Uh, obviously your bone and muscles would just atrophy and waste away. Uh, so NASA came up with this protocol. They give us two and a half hours of scheduled exercise. Here I am on a treadmill. There's a workout machine in the background, like a weightlifting machine that uses vacuum tubes to generate the force. And there's also a bike. Um, so for me, and, and by the way, thank you to IMAX, the movie, A Beautiful Planet. They, they let me borrow some clips from that movie to, um, to share. So this clip is from A uh, Beautiful Planet. But um, you can see me running on the treadmill. One of the interesting things is it's not uh, attached to the wall. It's on a vibration isolation system. Thank God, because otherwise the station would just vibrate apart. And you got to use those bungee cords to keep you pulled down. Uh, here's Samantha doing some deadlifts, but that weightlifting machine is also floating, which is super important. And it has um, bench press, squats, deadlifts, curls, crunches. You can do just about anything on that. And the bike is pretty good. So they measured my bone density before I took off. Then they measured it after landing uh, 200 days later. And I lost 0.0% of my bone density, which is pretty amazing. Um, something that I never expected, but it, it, uh, doing my exercise and I took a vitamin D tablet every day. Those two things, you know, kept me in good shape physically. My favorite thing to do in space was take pictures. And here I am with one of the cameras we use for the IMAX movie. Uh, this is a Canon. Most of the other pictures on here were taken with Nikon, but one of the many advantages of an astronaut is because I'm a total photography nerd. I, they told me that I took more um, pictures than any other astronauts had ever taken, um, is that you have the best, just high quality professional lenses and cameras everywhere up there. It's really awesome. As a photographer, that was fun. And this module I'm in right now is the cupola. It's a seven windowed module that, um, is the most awesome place anywhere on earth or not on earth. Uh, but you really feel like you're in space. You're surrounded by these windows on my SCS 130 space shuttle mission. I installed it. And then four or five years later, I went back and got to use it. So um, most of the pictures you're seeing here were taken through the cupola. 
And these are just a few of the images I took. Um, the During my 200-day mission, I saw 23 different hurricanes and typhoons and tropical systems. And this one was just by far the most amazing. It was called MISAC. It was March, April uh, Pacific storm. It was the biggest one ever. And uh, it really hurt the Philippines. It, it killed a bunch of people there. It was a terrible storm, but it was also beautiful and and terrifying when you see that from space that big black eye is pretty amazing in a beautiful planet there's a video of this pass that was it was really impressive this is there's a couple of things here this is a uh, big island in indonesia the papua new guinea island and as i flew over it was orbital noon so the sun was right overhead and uh, it was just ocean and a green island and then as soon as the sun hit the island, all these rivers showed up. So normally you can't see rivers at all from space, but when the sun glint reflects off of them, you know, this happened. And you know, one of, there's a talk I'd like to do. I haven't done it yet, but I'd like to discuss patterns that repeat from the microscopic to the human scale to the galactic scale. You know, there's just some patterns that repeat. And to me, this looks like capillaries, you know, blood vessels. Um, but it's really jungle. It's just water flowing out of the jungle into the sea. The white part is the sea, the black part's the jungle. And I remember this moment very well. I, I was looking down and I thought, man, this is the jungles of the South Pacific. There's people down there that are primitive. They've never had technology. They don't have electricity. And, uh, you know, what would they think if they knew there was an astronaut flying in space, taking a picture of them? Uh, it was a pretty profound moment to think how far we've come in technology, which is most of the time good, but maybe not all the time. And these are just a few different images. Um, in the top left, you can see uh, snow in, 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 I think this is uh, Eastern Europe, like uh, between Yugoslavia and Ukraine. Um, Russia and Canada are white. That's all I can say, especially in the wintertime. And it's like five, it's all, three quarters of the earth is just white in a row. It's amazing. Um, this, this is the Bahamas on the right. The Caribbean has this gorgeous blue turquoise aqua color surrounding the islands. It's, um, you see that color in all the oceans around the world, but nowhere like the Caribbean, it's just massive. Um, the bottom left is the outback of Australia, which is very red. I'm mean, the first time I opened the cupola windows, I went back inside and I was working and all of a sudden the whole space station turned red. And I looked out the window and there was Australia and I had no idea that the earth, the colors on earth were so intense. They would light up the day, daytime of the space station, but they did. And then on the, on the bottom right is in the Congo, some rivers there. I think it's part partially the Congo river, but um, again, you can't see it until the sun reflects. And then it's like, man, there's a lot of rivers down there and that's a really long river. Um, but that part of Africa, that central part of Africa really is dark. I mean, it's, it's almost black. The, the, the darkness. South America is dark, but it's more green. But the middle part of Africa is very, very dark um, from space. This is a um, maybe there's definitely on the Mount Rushmore of the best pictures I took or videos. Uh, this is the northern lights over Europe. There's Norway. You can see all the snow in Denmark and Norway there. Uh, the moon, the moonlight is lighting up Earth, and that's why you can see it. There's St. Petersburg. Um, Helsinki and Latvia and Estonia are on the left. Uh, and there's Moscow. You can see it's surrounded by snowy land um, as we fly into Siberia in the clouds. But the northern lights were always this ghost in December and January. You, you see it when it's uh, when it's nighttime in the northern hemisphere. And um, it was an amazing, uh, just amazing thing. Alien, an alien experience, really. And these are electrons from the sun that get trapped in our magnetic field and funneled down to the northern magnetic pole and the southern magnetic pole. And one of the things about that that is interesting is that um, it is, uh, there's a lot of radiation, and I'll talk about that here in a second. Um, <clears throat> but this is an image, it's just, I took a thousand images like this. Um, it's just the earth, there's a cloud, you can see the, the shadows from the thunderstorm are going off into the distance hundreds of miles. You can see where the earth turns into a black line and that's called the terminator. That's the point on earth or the line on earth really where it goes from daytime to nighttime. 
Um, but it's just a beautiful shot and it's a beautiful planet. So the IMAX movie that we made, uh, Tony Myers was director for, was called A Beautiful Planet. And it's very appropriately named. It really is a beautiful planet. Uh, but it's not perfect. It's like, not, you know, most of what you see is beautiful from space. But there are some some problems that you could see. Uh, one, one of those is pollution, especially over China and also over India. China is just brown smog in the northeast part. Um, but another one that, that was really disturbing was deforestation. And this is an area in the Amazon. Uh, normally, you can't see it. Normally, it's white, you know, clouds and thunderstorms. But on this day, it was clear and that should be just a dark green patch, but unfortunately they're chopping down trees um, for farming, but also for the trees. The trees are really valuable. The, the hardwood is very expensive and um, it it's just not the way to manage a rainforest. You know, most of the species on earth are down there. It's a, uh, it's, it's a bad thing. And for as bad as climate change is, it's eventually going to fix itself. Um, we're not making any more dinosaurs and, you know, we're going to run out of fossil fuel at some point and maybe hopefully decades, probably centuries in worst case, a thousand years from now, you know, climate change will be over. Uh, but species loss is forever. And so when you lose, you know, when you deforest so Madagascar is the worst example, but also the Amazon, um, you know, that's something that's forever. So that, that is one thing that you can see with your eyes from space for sure. Another aspect about um, this perspective that I gained that I didn't expect, it was really unexpected, uh, was looking at the earth at night. So I remember it was my fifth night in space. I looked out and I saw these city lights and I thought, I, during the daylight, you can't tell there's people down there. It's just this planet. But at nighttime, there's no doubt, you know, because of city lights. Um, and as I, as I thought about that, I, I said, you know what, what I'm seeing is not population what i'm seeing is wealth and this is a composite picture from a geosynchronous satellite but you can see uh europe there lots of lights lots of people lots of wealth um you can see saudi arabia there's only 25 million people in saudi arabia but there's lots of lights on there um lots of wealth but there then there's africa you know there's a billion people in africa you got the nile river in the north you've got nigeria has some lights on on the west coast and uh, Johannesburg in the south. And other than that, man, it is dark. Um, and there's so there's a lot of people there, but no wealth. And what struck me was that you could see how people live from outer space. And that was not something that I expected. And it raises some questions, you know, why is that and what can be done about it? Um, and this is probably the most striking picture of all. This is the Korean Peninsula. You're looking east. So on the right, that is South Korea. That big bright thing is Seoul, South Korea. The little white dots are squid boats out, out in the ocean, and you can barely see Japan in the right. Um, all those city lights on the left are China, and that black hole in between China and Seoul, and you can see a, there's a brown line at the top part of South Korea. That's the DMZ. And in between the DMZ and China, there's a black hole, and that's North Korea. You know, same number of people on both sides of the border. But you see the little white dot there is Pyongyang. Um, and this is like a picture of politics. You can see where, where nations get their politics right, or at least partially right. Um, people's lives are generally improved, where there's democracy and where there's free market economy. Um, moving in that direction helps people's lives. And <laughs> moving in the other direction, they're living in the dark. And this is a place where you can really see politics from space. Um, and one of the things, there's so much awesomeness about space. And, you know, if you do your exercise, you can come back in pretty good shape. The weightlessness doesn't hurt you that much, but the, uh, the radiation can. So I've gotten skin cancer after both of my space flights and there's, and it affects your DNA in ways that we don't know. We, unfortunately, NASA is not even studying it. Um, these are the Southern lights. And again, thank you to IMAX. This is a scene that they, um, they process for the IMAX movie, but you just see this green flowing river of plasma and our eyes are designed to work in black and white at night. Um, but even so you can still perceive the green color and the red color. Uh, not this intensely, the camera makes it more bright, but it really, you really can't see those colors and you can see it moving in real time. Um, and all of that radiation looks really cool, but it's also, you know, it, it, it kind of lets you know that it's going through your body. And I taught in, in the book, how to astronaut, I talk about, 
having those particles hit my optic nerve and seeing white flashes. And um, that that's a part of space travel that's going to be tough to solve for really long duration missions. Uh, but it's something we can't ignore. We got to we got to think about. And this is another amazing shot. I took this again, thanks to IMAX. This we got this from the movie, but um, I shot this. You can see this the moon reflecting on the ocean down below. Uh, in the daylight, our atmosphere is blue and red and orange. At nighttime, it's this kind of brownish, greenish haze. Um, and there, and then the distance there is our Milky Way. And there's just so many billions of stars you can't even imagine. Uh, if you go down the cupola, turn off the lights, turn off the lights in Node Three, let your eyes adjust. The uh, you know what you see in the distance is it's just mind blowing. It's so awesome. Uh, and it, it does definitely give you a, a perspective um, that you don't get being on Earth. Um, and so that, this is the last picture I took in space. I remember looking at my preview monitor on the camera thinking, this is the best picture I've ever taken in my life. I'm done. I, and I just stopped taking pictures. I downloaded it and I was done. Um, and after I left NASA um, a couple years ago, I came to the conclusion that you know I could stick around. My boss told me it would be five years before I flew again. Um, and I had already done everything there was to do at NASA and I was ready for a new challenge and I was still reasonably young. I was still in my forties, um, and barely. And uh, I said, you know what, it's time to leave and do some other stuff. And I've had a chance to write a few books. Um, I just signed, signed a, a, a kid's book deal. So hopefully in another year or two, I'll have a, my first kid's book out after, after how to astronaut and, the the thing I'm really passionate about is is TV and film. I've got a couple TV shows that I would that I would love to do. Um, I had a chance last year to set this uh, be on this project called One More Orbit. It was in honor of the Apollo 11 50th anniversary, um, and we took a jet, flew around the planet. We set a, a bunch of world records, speed records, going around Earth over the North and South Pole. But the best part about it for me was that I got to direct a documentary about it. So originally I was going to be a pilot on it, but uh, I didn't have enough time to get the training. And so the guy that put it together said, well, why don't you make a film? And that, it was just awesome. So it just came out. It's on uh, Amazon and iTunes and uh, it's on like 20 different pay-per-view things. But that was so much fun for me to do one more orbit as a director. So hopefully I get to direct some more projects. Um, and this summer in, uh, in the middle of lockdown where we were kind of sitting around, uh, I wanted to do a teaser for a show about space photography. And then there was this, there was a small film competition. So we said, well, why don't we just make a, we'll just make a, uh, a, 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 a short film. So I made a 10 minute short film called cosmic perspective. It's about how space photography has changed our perceptions of earth. And like, we used to think it was flat, you know, we used to think of earth as a two dimensional place. Then once we had airplanes and eventually rockets, you could see that it was a three dimensional place. And, there were there were there was an up, um, and now that we have things like the Hubble Space Telescope, um, we, we're actually seeing the universe as a four dimensional place. So when you see these crazy galaxies and so on, you're not so much looking far away as you are looking back in time, which is pretty amazing. So anyway, so I'd like to turn that show into a into a series, um, like a docu-series kind of thing, or maybe a documentary, but I think I'd prefer the series. Uh, and I talked about A Beautiful Planet, but that was that was kind of what got me um, started when I was in space. I was super lucky I got to make this movie um, or ha just help. Tony Myers was the director, and she had directed all the space movies going back to the 80s, and she was amazing. She was my mentor. She kind of taught me everything I knew needed to know about <laughs> making a movie. And our director of photography was a guy named James Nyhouse who uh, taught me about cameras and all the, all the intricacies of filming and shooting these shots. Um, so when I did one more orbit, I asked James to um, be my director of photography for that. And uh, we dedicated the movie to Tony. Unfortunately, Tony passed away from cancer, but this idea of writing books and telling stories through TV and film, I think is how you can impact people the most. You know, some pe people are always like, well, when are you going to run for office? And um, I kind of came to the conclusion, I think I can make more impact by telling really cool stories that are meaningful um, through writing and, and TV and film. So anyway, it's a, 
it's probably a case study in um, how to completely reinvent your, <laughs> how to make the most drastic midlife career change, uh, going from fighter pilot astronaut to author and filmmaker. But hopefully it works out. We'll see. It's, I'm still new at it. It's only been a couple years I've been trying. Um, so with that, um, I think we could probably jump onto some Q and A. Uh, let me see if I can stop sharing. How's that Pedro? That's great, Terry. So I'll start off by saying, wow. <laughs> so that was, fast. I was talking fast. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was amazing. And, uh, and like I said, mission accomplished, uh, I really enjoyed the book thoroughly, uh, all the different stories that you had to, to tell. Um, uh, we'll get to some of the questions coming in in a few minutes, but would love to just hear you mentioned you tied up at the end there on making this pivot after being an astronaut to being a, a director and other things, but would love to learn kind of what led you to be an astronaut. Um, you know, you yeah. may have taken one of the more traditional paths, but also describing some of the, uh, the paths of uh, some of your fellow astronauts. Yeah. So when I was a kid, the first book I ever read was about Apollo. It was one of those little cardboard, you know, for kindergartner first reader books. Uh, and I was hooked. I grew up with pictures of airplanes and rockets and spaceships on my wall. I was very lucky because my parents supported me. They, they didn't really know what you need to do to be an astronaut. You know, I was really the first guy in my family to go to college, but um, they really were supportive of me. So I was very fortunate. Uh, when I was about eight or nine, I went to the Air and Space Museum and saw an IMAX movie called To Fly. And they still show it. Um, and it is the most awesome movie. It's it's just so cool. And I was just like captivated watching this giant screen movie, um, which is what made filming A Beautiful Planet so special that I grew up in love with IMAX. And I used to go to this Air and Space Museum every five or 10 years to see the next movie. And then I got a chance to have some small part of making one that was really cool. Uh, and then in high school, I read The Right Stuff, the Tom Wolf book. It's a classic. The movie's great. It's aged very well. And um, uh, it's just a great book and it kind of, sh it showed me the step-by-step, -step, uh, way. So, and then I ended up as a fighter pilot. And like you said, I went to the air force Academy F 16s and then test pilot. That was my, that was my, my way in. That's great. Thank you for sharing. And, um, you know, let's talking a little bit about, uh, your, so you talk at length about your experiences with your fellow astronauts and cosmonauts. And, um, it was really interesting to hear about the collaboration across um, very different cultures. Uh, you talk a lot about your interaction uh, with uh, the cosmonauts and learning how to fly uh, a Soyuz spacecraft, but uh, also describing just the, the more regular mundane interactions day to day and dinner being one of your favorite times. I thought that was really interesting, but would love to hear a little bit more about um, that collaboration and how you relate it to um, how companies like ours uh, do business. Mm -hmm. So this is super important. I mean, culture is always the hardest thing to change. It's also the most important thing. I would much rather have people with the right attitude and the and the basic skills they need, and then they can be flexible and learn rather than have the most experienced guy in the world for this one particular thing. Um, as long as you have that right mentality, you can probably do just about anything. And in space, I mean, it's the International Space Station. So there's always Russians and Americans, and then there's often Europeans or Japanese or Canadians, or, you know, the, it's, it's a mix of people. And I think the reason I got picked, to be honest, there's a lot of fighter pilot, test pilots that are smarter looking than, and better looking than I am. Um, but I, I had done an exchange at the French Air Force Academy for a semester, and I spoke French, and I'd done an exchange in Finland as a kid. I lived with a family in Finland, and I think that international experience was something that NASA really was looking for and that no one else had that. I, that was one of the things that really set me apart. Um, but, you know, business is global today. And I think, and Americans are not global in general. I mean, some of us are, but for the most part, we just live in America. We take our two years of high school Spanish and then we never, you know, um, we don't have this world view. And um, I, I've been blessed. That I have been able to have a world view in the Air Force. I lived around the world. In NASA, I spent years traveling around the world. Since I've left NASA, I've, I've been to all seven continents speaking, right? So I've, 
and, and I did a program at Harvard Business School that was probably 90% international. So I know a lot of, you know, international executives around the world. And um, there's a whole other world out there. And it's an, it's an important thing for a company like Google. I, I, you guys know this, you guys get this, but, you know, it, you have to think globally uh, to think strategically. You know, the world is not are in our own little bubble. And if that's where you are, you're never going to reach your full potential as an individual or as a company, that's for sure. So you have to understand how to work with other people and other cultures. And as a commander, I made that my top priority, make sure we were one crew and not just the Americans and the Russians on two different crews, if you will. Absolutely. And never more important now than being in the midst of a, a global pandemic. Yeah. And you know, we're not going back in time that the way time works is it only goes forward. And so, you know, and the world is going to be more global and other countries are catching up. Um, you know, I've spent a lot of time in the Middle East here in Dubai, uh, where I am right now in Korea. You're like, oh, my God, these places are so modern. You're like, there's nowhere in America this nice or this modern. Um, and so I think, you know, we need to have that perspective that the whole world is moving on. There's a great book. It's called Factfulness. It was on Bill Gates' uh, reading list. I read it. Highly, 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 highly recommend it um, by a Swedish guy who unfortunately just passed away from cancer. I forgot his name. But he he talked about in the past, it was the West and the rest. Um, and it's not like that anymore. <laughs> the, lots of the world has caught up. And, you know, and America's still amazing and I love it. And it's it, it, we have the biggest economy. But um, a lot of the rest of the world is catching up, you know, every day. And so we just need to have that awareness so hope we can lead with our values and, and make, you know, be the anchor that promotes goodness in the world. But um, the re there's a whole other world out there that I think a lot of folks may not, may not understand. And a, a company like Google clearly does. So you guys can help us understand that. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's why I'm here. Uh, why I joined the army, why I'm here at Google, uh, to make a difference and to, uh, to help with those things. And it's super important to some, all of us here, um, at Google as well. Um, you know, as you think about some of those other lessons, uh, that we could learn from, uh, having similar missions to make the world a better place. What are some other principles and things? Uh, I know you shared some of them in the book, but would love to just hear your perspective on that. Um, by the way, Drew Morgan says, hi, uh, I, I told your classmate. Um, uh, so say the question again to help me understand that. So, um, so as, as some of the lessons that you've learned, uh, around collaboration and some of these other things, but what are, yeah. you know, a couple of other lessons that you've learned that we really need to, uh, take to heart, uh, given the, the global nature of our, uh, company. Right. So I think, um, uh, one of the things that I learned uh, as a as a commander of my crew was to make an effort to understand someone else's culture. So on Friday nights, I, just about every night, I would bring my dinner down the Russian segment and eat dinner with my cosmonaut friends. Then on Friday nights, we would have cultural program, kulturny program, and they would teach me Russian words that you don't learn in class and stuff like that. And I would always try and learn expressions. Um, I was just out to dinner with a group of Russians here and I gave a toast in Russian and, and like little things like that go so far. So if you're a company and you're working in another country, Google works in, I think all of them, uh, you, you know, you need to learn the local customs. And if, when you're working with customers, knowing a joke or a few words or expressions, making your products culturally sensitive, um, you know, those kind of things go a long, long, long way. And even a few screw ups in those areas also go a long way in the wrong way. So I think having some, some cultural awareness and you don't need to learn every language. You got Google translate, right? But yeah. <laughs> at least learning a few of the words and a few of the expressions for me, that was one of the top lessons that I learned. Uh, there's lots of other ones too, but um, I think for, for time, that's an important one. I appreciate that. Um, going back to the global pandemic, uh, you were editing uh, the book uh, and in the final phases of it when we hit kind of the the peak uh, of the oh, yeah. spring outbreak. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it prompted you to to write a, an afterword to the uh, uh, to the book, comparing isolation on Earth versus isolation in space. 
and would love to, uh, it's a pretty lighthearted take on it, but I uh, thought it had some interesting perspectives as well. I uh, would love if you could share that with the uh, yeah. folks. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it would have been completely tone deaf to not acknowledge COVID. And even though my manuscript was turned in literally like right as it was happening, um, I did add that chapter. So when I was in space, right before we launched, a uh, orbital Cygnus spaceship blew up in Virginia, carrying our equipment and supplies. A few months later, a Russian Progress cargo ship blew up. A few months after that, a SpaceX Dragon blew up. So NASA lost three cargo missions in an eight-month window. And when the Russian one blew up, the Progress is launched on a Soyuz rocket, the same rocket that people launch on. Thankfully, this was unmanned. It was just a cargo ship. But... Um, the Russians didn't want to launch my replacement until they did an investigation and until they made sure that our capsule didn't have something wrong with it that might have caused this. They didn't know what happened. So they basically said, hey, your replacements aren't coming, so you guys are stuck. And we don't know how long. And oh, by the way, you're low on supplies now. I was running out of my Reese's peanut butter cups. Okay. So, um, so, and I was commander. So I was, I'm super, I'm still super proud of my crew. Everybody handled it very well. Um, uh, I, I told our bosses, I said, hey, we'll come back next week if you need us to. We'll come back next month. We'll stay for a year if you need us to. We're in good shape. But the there were the couple, there were so many similarities between th that mental state and what happened in COVID because A, we were low on supplies and B, we didn't know when it was going to happen. And we had planned on doing stuff like this was affecting my career. It would affect a lot of stuff. So things like keeping a, a, a schedule, the exercise, um, making sure you have productive work to happen, um, making sure you have the right amount of interaction with human, other humans. Like if you live alone, you got to make sure you have some human interaction or you're going to get super lonely and depressed. If you live in a family, you got to make sure you have some private time or you're going to, your head's going to explode, you know, with the kids running around 24 seven for a year. So you have to balance, you know, make sure you have social time, make sure you don't have, make sure you have enough private time too. Um, I think attitude from, or do something creative. Uh, when I was in space, I worked on the movie and I took a lot of pictures. Um, since in 2020, I've written a couple books, you know, um, learn how to do photography, write the blog you've wanted to do, whatever, to figure out something creative and do that. Um, and then the attitude was the most important thing. Just like in the military, you were in the army. If you've got a deployment, as long as you know when the last day is, you can do whatever they tell you to do. But as long as you know that last day, but once that day starts moving, um, that's when people get, that's when morale crashes, right? And that's what's happened with COVID. It's this unknown thing. We don't know when it's gonna end. You know, it's, I know the vaccine's coming out, but it ain't ending in the next couple of weeks. It's, you know, there's gonna be problems for a long time now. So you have to ha have, keep a good positive mentality. When we were in space, my mentality was, I got the rest of my life, down on earth eventually they'll send us back home so i'm just gonna enjoy it make the most of my time here i was ready to come down i had stuff to do with my kids you know but there's there was nothing i could do to change it so why waste energy fretting about something that i can't change um it's that's literally a complete waste of time so i didn't and i just focused on how to make you know how to take lemons and make lemonade to take an overused expression and it is, it's such an important uh, aspect of maintaining your mental health and sanity and, mm -hmm. and um, stability in situations like that, like mm -hmm. this. And you actually share a few stories in the book, um, some you know deeper stories where um, you had some challenges uh, from time to time. And luckily you had a lot of support. You know, what were some other lessons that you learned aside from just that resilience and that, that positivity uh, around maintaining your own um, mental health while being out in space for for so long. Yeah, well, I think I just touched on it, but um, for sure. So, ha how to astronaut is not your father's book. It's it's. I think it's fun. I tried to make it fun and positive, but there's some negative. There's some like you know there was some bad stuff that happened too. So I write about that um, a little bit. But having time off by yourself was so critical. Because 90% of what you're doing is work and you're working with the crewmates or whatever. But at nighttime, you could go, you could shut the door to, to your crew cabin. Um, you could watch a movie. I, I watched uh, 
2001, A Space Odyssey. We watched Gravity, the space disaster movie. Um, I watched that TV show 24. I had never seen it before, and everybody said, I'm going to need a series. So I watched the 24 episodes. I watched The Americans. But taking that time to just have some time alone. Now, if you're a busy executive and you got kids and you're, you're not going to get a lot of time alone, but you have to make sure you get some time alone to just let your brain decompress. A good friend of mine right now is, super, is struggling with sleep. Like he falls asleep and then he wakes up. And I'm like, dude, your brain is running 24 seven and you run, 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 sleep. And like, you have to have some time that you calm down. Uh, you got to turn these things off, turn your Google pixels off, <laughs> a plug for your device there. Um, you, you know, we, the, here's a story. I, I landed on my space shuttle flight, do a, the post flight walk around in the shuttle, do all my science experiments, get reunited with my family. Um, finally I'm back, um, in my room. And I feel like I weigh a million tons and I'm dizzy, but I turn on TV and it was CNN and this was 10 years ago. And I don't know what she was talking about, whatever the, the news was 10 years ago, you know, Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen and blah, Kim Kardashian and blah, blah, blah. It was just like nails on a chalkboard. I literally had to jump up and turn it off like 30 seconds later. And because a couple hours ago, I was in outer space looking at this beautiful blue planet you know, thinking these big world peace, all these great thoughts. And now here I was just in noise. It was terrible. And that that moment really hit home to me is how much noise we have. That was 10 years ago. Now with these guys, the noise is constant. It never ends. And so in order to have a nice human life, and I think it affects your brain, like how neurons are wired in our brain. I, I'm just a fighter pilot. I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure our brains are developing differently, especially for kids because of this constant, uh, the, the air force had an acronym CPA continuous partial attention, um, which is a pretty accurate description of me most of the time. And probably almost every human in the, in a, in a developed nation. Thank you for that. Absolutely. And I uh, really appreciate your insights. And uh, we have time for a couple of questions uh, from uh, the Dory. So we'll start off with why is spacewalking so detailed in planning for time? Yeah, it's super detailed. And we spend a lot of time in the pool in Houston doing what we call development runs to try and save one minute here. If you can do a shortcut, if you can avoid one tether connection, you know, every little small thing you can do to save time, you try and do it because it's just dangerous. When you're outside, there's debris flying around. And if a little piece of rock or a metal bolt or something hits you going eight kilometers a second, you know, it could kill you. Um, or if you accidentally cut your suit and the air leaks out, or if the suit leaks water, there's a lot of bad things that can happen while you're outside. Plus the radiation environment is worse outside. You don't have that, even that thin aluminum shell protects you a little bit. So basically, as soon as you open the hatch, you're on the clock and you need to get moving. And we, we practice it in development runs and then try and execute it just to not waste even, even seconds. It's so important that attention to detail in the training and you talk about, you know, uh, all the training you do for all the contingencies um, because you don't know what's going to happen. And, and you talk yeah. about sometimes that, that it went bad, you know, with the Columbia um, yeah. disaster being the, the most uh, uh, obvious one. Mm -hmm. uh, so super important. Um, yep. We'll take another question. What, what was your journey to becoming an astronaut? And you, you talked a little bit about this uh, early on, um, but you know, what right. were some of the studies that really helped you and were pivotal uh, in your right. time on the space station? So a few specifics for NASA in particular, you have to have a college degree that is technical. So engineering or science or medicine, something like that. Um, and that's the minimum, but there's 18,000 applications. A lot, my last job at NASA was sifting through 18,000 applications. So if you only have the minimum, you're not getting in. So most of the engineers and scientists have PhDs. By most, I mean all. Um, most of the pilots are test pilot, fighter pilots, by, which is pretty much all. Um, so there's a couple different tracks. You can be the, the pilot track or the engineer track or the scientist track, or there's a medicine track. Um, but the bottom line is everybody does well you know, they're, they're at the top of their game. Um, I, the kind of folks who had straight A's and were number one in everything they ever did, those guys kind of made me a little nervous. Um, but uh, 
because I, I always wanted to have someone who had lived life and had failed at something or wasn't perfect. But uh, the other thing besides that, the basic tracks, you want something that helps you stand out. I remember this one lady had been a NASCAR mechanic, which I thought was pretty cool. That was an unusual thing. I, I put that in the, hey, take a look at this one category. Um, having flying experience or mountain climbing or scuba diving, something that we call is operational. It's not just sitting in a classroom, you know, writing on a chalkboard. You actually are doing something where your body is at risk. <laughs> um, those are important things for NASA also. Not the thrill seekers. I Personally, I never wanted to go to space with a thrill seeker. Um, I don't want base jumpers, you know, checking my six while I'm out in space. But uh, people who know how to work with their hands in a dangerous situation is important. Yeah, and you talked a lot about um, the emotional intelligence and the, the, the mental fortitude that's needed uh, mm -hmm. in space as well um, as one of the key criteria that you looked at. I think it's the biggest. I mean, there's lots and lots of smart engineers. There's lots and lots of s smart test pilots. Um, but guys that you want to spend six months with in a can. Um, and when the we, we went through this period where the emergency alarm was going off like every day the alarm went off i finally took a little yellow sticky and i started it was like a little football pool kind of thing or i started making tick marks every time i had a caution a warning an emergency or a funny smell and i had the u.s segment russians just to make fun of it because it was really grating on us like this was it was like all right guys that's enough warnings you know so you you know when those kind of things happen you have to be able to either use humor or you know you don't want to you don't want to freak out when you're in a space station in space absolutely <laughs> um i guess we have time for one more quick uh quick question before we wrap up so um we talked a little bit about this as well nasa and roscosmos work so well together why can't while we can't say the same about the us and russia why do the space programs work so well together and what can we learn from that yeah that's a great question it's probably the most important lesson that i learned in space it's something I like to talk about when I do speeches. Um, and uh, I think in general, technical people just want to get the job done. They don't care about all the political BS. Um, we do a lot of toasting in Russia and and if to be and it was right in the middle of sanctions and Crimea and Ukraine and you know it was a bad time to say the least when I was flying in space last. And we would always, the first toast would be politics is politics. And then, okay, then we would just start toasting about our friendship or whatever was going on. So we didn't it, like ignore politics, but we um, uh, we addressed them and then we just left them behind and we worried about our things. So I think technical scientific people tend to see ideological politics as BS because they are, and they they're able to just get the job done. Um, plus there's no animosity. I love the Russians. That was the highlight of my time in space was spending time with the Russians. And we, you know, I, I, I have a great story about that. I don't have time to talk about it now, but the prime minister of Russia called us and said, we're going to work together to get through this really serious emergency. Um, while at the same time it was back and forth Twitter war about sanctions. Um, but the, 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 at the bottom line is the, the goal of most governments is just to keep themselves in power. It's not to help people out, which is why democracy and free market economies are so important because at least in theory, to some extent, a democracy is about the people. And uh, we, we need to figure out how to get our politics right down here on earth um, in order for, in order to turn those lights on in Africa, to be honest, at the end of the day. A great perspective to, to finish off on. Thank you so much, Terry, for joining us today. Um, I enjoyed the book immensely. I enjoyed your talk, uh, giving the context around it even more. Um, so uh, everyone out there, How to Astronaut, An Insider's Guide to Leaving Planet Earth. Uh, a great read. Uh, there's a link in the, uh, the live chat box uh, with the link to the book. Um, highly recommend uh, if you're able to to take it on. But again, thank you, Terry, so much. I appreciate it. And we all do. Thanks for having me, Pedro. This was fun. Too bad it's not in person, but may maybe someday soon. Someday soon.